Hello, hello, welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous Patreons, my British Rail Critics, and my Underwater Train Finders, Thomas Ward, and Lord Captain Von Thrust III. You are the reason why this content remains weird. I'm very weird. I don't know if you noticed that. I'm just an oddball, crazy nut job. Anyway, we're going to keep going with something that was a niche list that I didn't honestly think I would make a sequel to, but people really liked it and offered me a whole bunch of suggestions for other locomotives that I could talk about. So, um, yeah, we're going to make a sequel. This is five more of the weirdest successful trains ever. The Santa Fe CF-7. Well, that's the shortest hood unit I've ever seen in my life. It kind of looks like if you took an EMD SD-40 and just like squished it together. And to be fair, the CF-7 is technically an EMD, but it was not in this form originally. They're switchers and successful ones, but these were rebuilt by the Santa Fe Railway between 1970 and 1978. What were they originally? Well, that's the weird part. These are F units, arguably one of the most iconic American diesels ever. W why would they turn the glorious F units into tiny squished switchers? Well, that's because Santa Fe needed switchers. They didn't want to necessarily invest in new ones and they were wondering if it'd be cheaper to remodel their old F units into hood units. Because the F7s were dated, but they still were powerful enough to do switch work, the problem was their car bodies. And car bodies are awful for switching. Because of the job's nature, they have to be able to go backwards and forwards. Now, car bodies can go in reverse, but it's almost impossible to see when those diesels are going backwards. Hood units are much better for this, but like I said, Santa Fe didn't want to actually have to buy any new ones when they had perfectly serviceable F units kicking around. So they remodeled them with new custom-made bodies and called them the CF-7s. And they were great, absolutely exceptional. Not only did they give the original F units a new lease on life, allowing them to live long past the point that they would have been retired, the CF-7s also outlasted themselves. A handful are in preservation, and Santa Fe sold them to quite a number of different places all across North America, including Amtrak. As of 2017, there are still a number still in service to this day, in various forms, they've been in service over 60 years. Quite an impressive achievement for a diesel that looks like it got thrown into a hydraulic press. The British Rail Class 13. British Rail! Would you please just leave me alone? I don't want to talk about you anymore! You just have so many locomotives and they fit into so many lists! It's like impossible to dance around you! I have to talk about you and I don't wanna! I don't want to do it, but I have no choice. It's my curse. Darkness the curse. Anyway, British Rail Class 13 may look like two separate locomotives, and honestly, they sort of are. They were designed in 1965 because they needed more powerful shunters for the Tinsley Marshalling Yard. The thing was, the Tinsley Yard was a hump yard. A hump yard uses, well, a hump on the lines to shunt cars into positions. Instead of forcing the locomotives to go all the way down to each siding and then all the way back up, they simply put the cars on the hill, uncouple them, and allow them to coast down into the trains that they're supposed to be in. It's actually a pretty clever system and used in many different countries, but they were worried the 08s as they were might get stuck on the hump. So to prevent this, they came up with a solution. And it was one of the most dirt simple solutions I've ever seen, but it did work. They permanently coupled two 08s together in a master and slave configuration and even removed the slave's cab entirely. As a result, the power output was doubled, because there were two locomotives. And it worked! They served the Tinsley Yards quite well, but they only ever made three of them, because they were built for a very specific yard in a very specific situation. The Tinsley Yards stopped hump shunting in the 80s, so the locomotives became unnecessary, and all three of them were withdrawn by 1985. None of them were preserved, but to be fair, it would be pretty easy to make one again, they are literally two Class 08s duct taped together. That is exactly what the Class 13 is. So even though the originals are gone, there's plenty of 08s still kicking around. You could make them again if you really wanted to. The Victorian Railway's B Class. Well, why is this on the list? That's not weird at all. 
it looks pretty normal, actually. I mean, for a diesel built in the mid-20th century, anyway. Just looks like an F unit. What's so bizarre about- oh, 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 oh. Okay, yeah, that's, um, that's a little odd. That's a little bit odd. Ordered and operated by the Victorian Railways in Australia, they actually initiated the dieselization of that system, and were used for both passenger and freight services. If it wasn't obvious, they were based on the EMDF units. The major obvious difference is that they'd stuck a second cab on the rear end, both being streamlined with a distinctive bulldog nose. There are some other minor differences, mostly to reduce the axle load, as the EMD units, by default, were too heavy for the Victorian tracks. But when the first locomotive was delivered in 1952, they turned out to be exceptional. The addition of a second cab at the rear meant that they functioned much better than the default car body units because they could run well in both directions. You didn't need to worry about going in reverse, because I mean, there really wasn't a reverse, was there? It didn't matter which way the locomotive was going, it was always technically going forwards as far as it was concerned. The locomotives proved so successful that some are even still in service. And I'm not talking about preservation. I mean, there are three preserved, but I mean seriously, some are still working on the Victorian lines. A phenomenal display of usefulness by what looks like a bit of an oddball. Rack Railways, also known as Rack and Pinion Railways, or Cog Railways, or Cog Wheel Railways, there's a lot of different names for them. But basically, a Rack Railway is another way of doing a funicular, <clears throat> uh, which I can't pronounce as the last episode would have shown you, but it's not a funicular at all because there's no cables involved here. It is a steep grade railway that uses a toothed rack rail. This third rail that sits between the two normal ones is toothed, and the locomotives are equipped with a cog or a gear. This cog fits into the gaps of the third rail and allows the locomotives to handle steep grades above 10%. They were designed in the early 1800s, and there are still many versions of them kicking around. The first cog railway was the Middleton Railway between Middleton and Leeds in West Yorkshire, England, United Kingdom. Not content to have the first cog railway, this railway also had the first commercially successful team locomotive, the Salamanca, that ran in 1812. As funny as the cog railways may seem, they have their uses when it comes to steep grades. The Southern Pacific Class AC-12 Ah, the AC-12. The cab-forward steam locomotives actually had a bunch of different models made for it, but the AC-12s are arguably the most famous, and definitely one of the largest. They entered service on October 27, 1943, and only 20 were ever produced, but they were actually pretty good. You may be wondering how the crew on board a steam engine is able to control, say, uh, the firebox, when the tender is in what we would normally call the front of the steam locomotive. Well, that's because the AC-12s, and many of the cab-forwards actually, were oil-fired. They would still pull the tenders behind the locomotive, and the oil would be drawn up through pipes. That's about the only difference between the AC-12s and a conventional 2884 locomotive. And they were utilized all over Southern Pacific System, though they were probably most famous for working on Donner Pass and Cascade Summit. So that they were only utilized for about a decade, despite how good they were, but it had nothing to do with any fault with the locomotives. They were just curated, well, in the early 1940s and they were retired in the mid-50s. That is because of a certain type of locomotive becoming much more popular and appearing to push steam out of existence on America's railways. Yes, diesels, diesels came into being. The dieselization of America's railways killed off all the steam locomotives pretty much, and the AC-12, weird or otherwise, was no exception. Why bother to modify steam locomotives in a weird way to make them cap forward when the new EMDs did that by default? When you look at it from that perspective, I kinda get it. Fortunately, one of the AC-12s, SP-4294, is actually still around as it was preserved and is now on display at the California State Railroad Museum. So at least this oddball is still able to be appreciated by rail fans all over the world. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.